The following is a conversation with Siraj Raval. Siraj has one of the largest channels in the machine learning YouTube space. Over 700,000 people are subscribed to him as of this date. Uh, Siraj pumped out lots and lots of videos on topics such as coding tutorials, explaining beginner's concept in machine learning, and in other topics like uh, blockchain or other computer science things. Now, his rise came to an abrupt stop when a series of scandals hit him at the end of 2019. And there were a lot of articles written back then, Twitter posts made, and even Siraj himself made an apology video. But I was wondering, how did he feel like during all of this? What did he think back then? How did it come to this? Well, how did he feel during the highs and the lows of his career? And how does he look back on things now? I was struck by how straightforward Siraj was in this conversation. I was sure there was going to be wisdom in there for the rest of us, be that YouTubers or machine learners. And I was not disappointed. Um, he was definitely honest, looking back with a, a different view. And we touched on many things in this conversation. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you find something in there that helps you. And yeah, let us know what you think. Well, hello, everyone. Um, today is, is a special day. Um, in, in many ways, uh, Siraj, who is my guest today, is one of the, the pioneers of the field of ML YouTube. Now, I'm, I'm pretty sure uh, pretty much every single person in the field has heard of Siraj, has seen him, watched one of his videos or something like this. And uh, if if I can maybe frame it a little bit, is that you were one of the first machine learning YouTubers. You became really popular quickly. Things went uphill, uh, more views and so on. And then I think it's fair to say it, it kind of all came crashing down in, in, in like a very short period of time and uh, then it it's it just sort of crumbled if I, I I don't I I can't really frame it any differently there seemed to be like things one on top of another that just all came in like a month or so the same month it seemed it seemed crazy this this time at the end of 2019 so yeah I'm 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 happy to to host Siraj today uh, thanks so much for being here and uh you know uh, talking and and you agree to talk a little bit about your side of things of what happened and what you're doing now so yeah welcome thanks it's great to be here i love your videos they're uh they're definitely they've got a personality and character to them that i definitely admire and i'd like to see more of thank you and and yeah so i think you well <laughs> Since since you're since you're the OG YouTuber of this, you know that I guess character is a little bit of of what it takes. I want to go back a little bit to the beginning, though. You, if I if I recall correctly, you started studying economics. Is that correct? Correct at Columbia. That was my freshman year. I was an economics major. Yeah, and and for some reason you switched over to computer science because it. What what took you there? Um, uh, well, I was, um, I took a semester to travel around Europe using couch surfing. I was couch surfing for three and a half months. And the first person that I couch surfed with in London, his name was Alex McCall. He showed me, um, his terminal window. He had a Hackintosh that he made and he really inspired me to get into computer science. It turned out, you know, several years later that Alex uh, wrote the book, the O'Reilly book on JavaScript. And he has this really cool startup called Clearbit that he already sold by now. Um, but I got to meet him before all that happened. And once I saw Alex terminal and all the cool things he was doing, I knew that once I got back to Columbia, I needed to like switch over to computer science because that was how you really made an impact in the world. Yeah. So I, I guess you saw pretty early that the impact was to, was to be made, right? I think a lot of people go into economics and they think like, they maybe think a little bit of money mm -hmm. if they go into economics because it's it's kind of close to it. But I, I guess computer science, especially you know nowadays, is is really 
the impactful field or one of one of the impactful fields. Little known fact, I also didn't. I started out in medicine and then switched over to computer science. So so much of the of the same journey there. And then did you did you finish computer science or? No, I dropped out um, my senior year of all times to drop out. Wow. But, yeah. And I and that was because of YouTube or? No, no, no. Okay. So I dropped out because I had a robotic startup at the time. Um, we were making a six degree of freedom robot that would pick things up off the floor for older people with something called ALS because they can't bend over. Yep. And uh, we built a prototype, raised money, but it turns out like nobody would buy it. And also there were some software problems at the time. This was, mm -hmm. this was like 2012. So um, yeah, I just um, moved to San Francisco from there, from New York. And then that's when I really started to feel like I was around my people, like techies. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're American originally, but from smaller town or big city or? I'm from Houston, Texas. So I was born here. Yeah. My parents are from India. Um, definitely have a deep connection with India. I still dream about India. Um, cool. And and then you were you were in San Francisco. And how did you get into YouTube? So I worked at a several contract jobs in San Francisco for companies like CBS Interactive doing mobile development. Um, I worked at Meetup for a year um, just as a general software engineer. I was in, I started off as an intern, and then um, I eventually. The last job I had, W2 job, was at Twilio, the API company. And I worked there as a developer educator for about eight months. Uh, and then I was fired mm -hmm. because I uh, I think it was just a performance thing. I, that, that's what they said. So I don't know. But I remember wanting, I, I learned a lot at Twilio about developer education and how innovative it could be. Um, to give you an example, we were learning about different ways of getting developers to use the Twilio API. And... You know, as I was writing documentation across nine different programming languages like Ruby and PHP and Python, one thing that I was told by my mentor was that we don't want to use too many exclamation points inside of our documentation, mm -hmm. because if you have more than three, what developers do is that they subconsciously think of not equals from code, and that gives them a negative impression of the text. And I was like, yeah. that level of detail, I never thought about that, but it really is an art. And so I started wanting to make videos on the side, and actually my first three YouTube videos I made while I was at Twilio at the conference room at midnight when nobody was there. And I showed it to my colleagues there and they were like, my boss was like, you know, that's great. That's cool. We don't think developers are going to use videos as a learning tool. They want something static like documentation. And so that's when I thought, well, maybe there, there's something here. And so once I got mm -hmm. fired, I got a severance and I had enough to live in San Francisco for about six to eight months. And that really gave me the impetus. I remember I had all my stuff in a box um, that they gave to me from my desk. And I literally the day I was let go, I walked across the street to a hair salon and then I got my hair dyed. And I was like, all right, I'm all in on this YouTube thing now. Like I have yeah. to figure out how to make this work. Did you, did you, just the hair. Did you consciously do that? Did you think I need some sort of a, a thing? Yeah. I mean, I was always inspired by um, a guy named Bill Nye, the science guy, and how mm -hmm. he, he was a very unique character for general science. And I thought, what is my thing? Um, I didn't know what exactly I wanted, but I remember a roommate of mine at the time who was a matchmaker. She was like, you know, you'd look really cool with like a silver streak in your hair. Mm -hmm. So I just tried it out. I mean, you chose better than me, the sunglasses. Now I have to code with sunglasses, which is annoying. Do you but, get, uh, you get, a, you get recognized with the sunglasses in person? I, I get, I get recognized with and, and without, I think the hairline is gives, gives it away. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's how, that's how, how branding works, I guess. So, but yeah, so then you, you just, you just started creating videos was it always machine learning or did you also like get into that somehow no so it started out my first few videos were all on bitcoin in fact my first video was called what is bitcoin yeah and that's really i think of bitcoin is the soul of the hacker community um everything comes from bitcoin and emerges outwards from there if i i'm not religious but like the closest thing to a religion would be bitcoin um but I started making machine learning videos just because 
it seemed really interesting. And I was really interested. AlphaGo really was the catalyst for me. Like, oh, there's something mm-hmm. here. Let me, let me start making videos on this with no credentials, no um, PhD or anything like that. It yeah. Also, also, I felt like um, this, this is kind of weird to say out loud, but like I'd spent six months in India traveling across the entire subcontinent before I started working at Twilio. And one thing that I saw was like, you know, I was living in such a box my whole life in the United States and India is such a beautiful country. However, there's a lot of issues there. It is a developing country, kind of ascending country, I like to say. Um, but, you know, we can't just solve all of these problems in our lifetime. And some of them are just, they're going to take many generations to solve. Perhaps if we created some sort of super intelligence, you know, digital organism God, it could solve everything for us. And the mm-hmm. thing that I personally could do was use my specific knowledge um, to help make that happen in the form of funny, interesting videos that would raise awareness around these technologies to as many people as possible. And that would somehow increase the amount of research happening in the field. And all of this together would accelerate development of a super intelligence. Yeah. I mean, that's, I have, I have one socialist, like borderline communist friend. And whenever I make fun of communism has never worked, he always says like, but we haven't tried with an AI super mind planner, right? And then I'm like, yeah, okay, that's got, it's got a point, right? But yeah, so di- when did you, when did you, so you had this plan of doing videos, when did you really see that this could be something? Like, was there a moment where you saw like, wait, you know, views go up and was there like a particular moment or, or did it come, you know, slowly or when did you really feel like, yeah, I could make this work? Well, I think it was three months into making videos once a week, because back then I could only do once a week. It took about 40 to 50 hours for a single video. Eventually Mm -hmm. I got up to three a week at my peak, but after three months of one video a week, I got um, someone emailed me from this company called Big ML, which was a machine learning platform. It was my first person who ever reached out to me and they wanted to pay me for a series of videos. And I was elated because ad revenue was like, you know, nothing really. Um, mm-hmm. I did have Patreon that definitely helped for sure. But that, that was my first, I think they paid me 2k USD for six videos, um, which was huge. And, yeah. and, and that was really like, oh, this is something. And then of course, Udacity reached out to me and that was yep. the, the biggest catalyst like for it to help um, make their deep learning course, Nano degree. Yeah. So yeah, U- Udacity, but, but that, that also fell through if I, if I recall correctly. And, and this is, so maybe for, for people who, who don't know, and you have made, you have made an extensive like apology videos about this, but it, some of your videos or, or you know, to, to the degree were plagiarized, not exactly the videos, but you would sort of write or show some code. And then you would say like, either like, oh, look at this code or watch me build a trading bot or something like this. And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, just be very vague about the origins of the code. Mm -hmm. And then you would, you put attribution, maybe really small at the bottom of the code but essentially it'd be other people's code that you, you presented. Uh, is that a, about a fair framing of, of things? So a lot of times you, you took other people's codes, didn't fork it on GitHub, but just kind of downloaded it, re-uploaded it, and then changed the, like the readme or, or maybe some wrapper and things. So when, yep. when was that, do you, do, was this always your, your mode of operating or did you use like, did you at some point start? Did it increase? Because that's what I'm, I'm wondering. Like I, right? You started out saying, you know, I could do, I could do raise awareness and so on, and you ended by or ended. You at some point you found yourself in a mode where you would a new video would just be like I take someone else's code, I make a video claiming essentially inferring that I I made it right. How, how did you get from A to B? So it was a process. It didn't happen all at once. I mean, if you look at my first few videos, they were like, I really did write the code for the first few videos. Um, they were like 10 to 20 lines using the skills that I learned at Twilio of like 
making something really basic, a skeleton app that a developer could just download and hit compile and it runs, make it as simple as possible. I would look at these very complex repositories for the initial versions of TensorFlow and, um, you know, um, a neural conversational model by Oriol Vignoles, who's my favorite researcher still to this day, and just try to condense it into, you know, 10, 20 lines as a wrapper. Um, but over time, I just, it, it was like a gradual process of, you know, instead of just raising awareness, it became more like chasing clout, right? Making the number go up, number go up for views, yeah. for likes. And there was also like almost no accountability. I was a lone actor. I wasn't working with anybody. Um, so that definitely made it easier to do something like that. And um, eventually, like once I moved from San Francisco to Los Angeles, um, and that was the last year and a half that I worked on YouTube. Um, so from 2018 to 2019, that's when um, I think that was a bad move. Like I'm not really an LA person, but that's when I really started to um, really chase the clout and pursue fame for the sake of it because I'd already gotten these opportunities and it seemed like I just needed to get to a million subscribers no matter what. Yeah. A million is, was that your personal goal or, I mean, for, for me, a million was always the point a little bit where you could live off of ad revenue. Was, was it like this or was it just a number you liked or? No, it was just a number. It was just like a fun yeah. little goal in my head. Yeah. Yeah. It, so, and did you, did you, did you at any point feel like, uh, maybe I shouldn't do this maybe at the beginning and did it become easier for you or? How, how did you think about yourself or did you just think, you know, everyone else is doing it or? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I, you know, everybody is the protagonist of their own story, right? Mm. I felt like I was doing, you know, just having the little name in the very bottom of the GitHub, not forking the code, but just putting it down there. That made me, you know, feel guilt free. Um, yeah. at the time, but obviously that wasn't how I should have done it. I mean, obviously what you did was, was very public and therefore the, the backlash I felt was also very public. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people got angry and, and, you know, once, once it all, let's say came crashing down, a lot of people came forward and said, oh yeah, me too. I was also, my code was plagiarized and so on. I. I, I feel like I have seen exactly stuff like this in research, it, like tons of times. People essentially copying papers, mildly attributing like once, but essentially the entire page would be would be like taken from, usually it's their earlier papers. So what authors will do is they will have like one new equation and then they'll write an eight page paper where seven and a half pages are essentially their old paper, right? And uh, so, so I mean, but th that is never, it's never as public, right? It's never as, 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 as big. I guess the more public one is, the, the worse it gets when something like this really, really happens. Uh, did you, so I know I've, I've read your Udacity course that, you you said that became an issue there right people try to tell you you can't plagiarize stuff is that is that correct or so i i've seen it like a tweet from someone at udacity saying you know the the course fell through essentially because they try to tell you that that's not how they do things or what is or maybe you can tell a little bit what the, the Udacity course, you said that was a big thing for you. Why did it fall through? Yeah. So, you know, the, the, what happened with Udacity was we had a 16 week course that I essentially designed and then Udacity helped me build a team around that to help me. One issue yeah. that one of the people at Udacity had that I was working with, he was also in the initial trailer video, Matt Leonard, was that I was not writing the code from scratch. I was yeah. using existing examples. And he didn't like that. Um, mm -hmm. We also didn't have that good a working relationship during the course. But I think in terms of falling through, um, that happened like, you know, everybody made money from that course, including Udacity. 
And there were several cohorts of students that didn't just run once. I think it ran like three mm-hmm. or four times. Udacity actually, Udacity actually approached, approached me two years after that course was over to do another version of it. And I did help yeah. with that too. Um, in terms of falling through, yeah, when all of this happened, then, you know, people came out and said this stuff. Um, yeah. I don't know what happened with the courts, honestly. I, I haven't. Okay. Paid. Maybe I, maybe I got, I got this one, this one wrong. Um, yeah. So, and so I've seen, like, I've, I've looked at your, your social blade and, and so on. You're, you're at about 700 K subscribers. And I've seen also an interview w- with Lex Fridman and you where essentially you, you also told him like, you know, what matters to me is views. I'm, I'm attuned to, to views, to more subscribers and, and so on. Uh, is it fair to say a little bit that you might have lost sight of, you know, the bigger picture or, or other things just in, in pursuit of this goal? It is, it is. I was definitely disillusioned with, um, AGI and the initial goals that I had at the start. I definitely also had a, you know, an issue with, uh, I had like a drug problem near the end. Um, I was doing. Um, too much of a certain drug that makes you really, um, up and have a lot of energy. And there was a point where I pretty much almost overdosed on it. Mm. And that's when I knew, like, I even like, you know, called the cops on myself to, cause I thought I was going to die. I, I don't, yeah. I've never really said this out loud before, but that was near the end. That, this is basically like a month or two before, um, you know, that scandal happened. And I was just, you know, I just felt like I was unfallible, like I was untouchable, like I could do no wrong. And yeah, I'd never had that level of fame before as well. Like that was pretty, that was, that was quite a, a drug of its own as well on top of that. But yeah, it was a gradual process, I think, of going from uplifting developers and like that being the primary concern to also then chasing clout, chasing fame wanting more opportunity, more views, um, uh, more recognition and just making uh, stupid decisions. Yeah, I can, I mean, I'm, you, you know, as, as a, as a, another YouTuber, I, I, I get the draw of this. Like I under, I can, I, I get this feeling of being sucked into these, into these metrics. And it's not only the metrics, right? The metrics are correlated with money, correlated with fame, and so on. Uh, I, I like, yeah, I, I see the, and so many YouTubers fall into this, right? And uh, your, your mistake was also a little bit that you, your, your setting was in an maybe like an academic or a professional setting where people actually care about. You know, not stealing stuff and things like this. So maybe, you know, you unluckily for you chose the wrong field <laughs> to do something like this in. Because in many other fields, I think this would have just, you know, been been completely fine. So, in addition to let's say making videos, and you were making an insane number of videos, like two a week or three a week, as you said, and that certainly also you had a schedule that certainly must have also pressured you. But then you also, there is this, there's the issue with your paper, right? Mm-hmm. And that, that to me, that to me was really something where I thought this is someone who, who, who is almost like blinded by either the speed or, or the fame or, or as you said, you felt infallible or something like this. So for people who don't know, you had written a s- number of research papers, but this particular one you even made a video about it. I think like I wrote a paper in a week or something Mm. like, and, uh, it was about, it was about the neural, the neural qubit. And one of your viewers then, uh, went public and uh, claimed and, and, and could show that this was copied from largely from two other papers copied together the the diagrams copied Mm -hmm. and the text copied. And you you changed some of the wording, which was the most puzzling thing to me. So instead of a, a quantum 
gate, which is equivalent to a logic gate, you changed it to a quantum door, which makes no I like this is a meme until today, right? And and instead of complex uh, numbers or complex Hilbert spaces, I think it was uh, complicated Hilbert spaces, which also is, is is kind of if you so maybe if you just if you look back now, what is what is your reaction now to to past you in with respect to that that paper? Yeah. Um, yeah, that was hilarious. That's eternally a meme now. Um, what I, yeah, I mean, I used AI to generate some words and like make things different. I, uh, what, so this was automated, the replacement. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 I think there's a tool called like, um, I think it's called like, it's, it's a web tool. I forgot. It's like AI mm -hmm. writer or something like that. You like paste in a paragraph yeah. and then it like rewrites it. Um, yeah. Like what a super decision that was. I, but there, there, I mean, it, at this point, it's really, it's not, it's not, it, it's not this, it's not quite, it's a step up from copying code and attributing someone at the bottom. Right. Because there you can still say, you know, I attributed them. I'm, you know, I can sleep at night. This is really, I go, I take paper, I put it deliberately into a tool that rewords it. And then I say, here's my, here's my paper, right? This is what, what made you, or how did you, how did you find yourself making that, that step that, you know, like the really from, I can justify this to myself to, I guess, I don't know what, well, maybe you explain better than, than me. Yeah. I, you know, it's just like ego. It's like, I'm untouchable and I can just do anything. And I, um, I guess I didn't really understand what it's so like before I plagiarized that paper, I talked to an actual quantum researcher, um, who works at in Santa Barbara for Google. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, he's like, we should write this, you know, I was, I was like, we should write this paper together. He's like, yeah, let's do it. It's going to take a year. And I remember thinking like, that's way too long for me. Like, I'm not doing that in a year. I'm going to do this in three days. And just thinking like, you know, I guess I didn't respect the scientific process enough to, yeah, it, it was just, um, to me, I just thought of it as like a, another link in the video description, just adding it. I should have just linked to the seven papers. I just, instead I put my name on it and just made it into one and I'm like, oh, people are going to like me more because of this. And mm -hmm. I'll have more credibility because of this instead of the opposite. And I don't know. I was just in but, general, I was just, you know, really, um, drugged out, honestly, like that. I don't know why I made a lot of the decisions that I did. Um, I'm sober now, by the at, way. Yeah. Yeah. At, at no point it, did it, did it ever, cause, cause that's, that's the baffling thing to me a little bit. And that, that, that shows me or at least seems a little bit like someone who has really lost touch a bit is is that when some when a it's like a an experienced researcher tells me it's gonna take a year to write a paper and sure if i think i'm fast i can i think i can do it in three months right mm -hmm. but three days is a like is a different thing so so clearly your idea was already, you know, I'm going to take a shortcut. It's not like I'm going to write the same paper in three days. It's just, um, how can I make a video out of this in the shortest possible time? Yeah. I was like, what's my next video? I wrote a research paper and just thinking about mm. that, that's really the angle. Like I want to make a video that shows or tells people that I wrote a research paper. Yeah. Yeah. So a lot of, I've, I've seen a lot of commentary saying things like you know it's a it's a shame you have a you have a good platform you're charismatic and you could have it, they say something along the lines of you you might have just as well credited all these people and just had the same effect like implying you know there would be another way of doing this you could just say you know here is a bunch of code by some cool people i'm going to show you how it works uh and and their implication is 
you would be just as famous, you would be just as liked and so on. Did you, first of all, do you think that's true? And second of all, did you think that's true? Like, or was it really your conviction? No, if I did that, I would be way less popular. I do think that that's true now. I yeah. did not think that was true then. Mm -hmm. I thought that I would have to be the guy with who is behind all of this in order for my brand and channel to grow because, yeah, yeah because it's just hard, like in the YouTube game to like differentiate yourself. And I felt like this was a way I could do that. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it is true, right? Um, I'm not sure that these people are correct. Like it's for sure good advice to credit the people whose work you present. But I myself, I'm not sure if they are correct when they say you would have been just as popular and 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 just as as you know well respected by the people who who think you really did do the, these things, right? I'm not sure. As you say, how how YouTube works is it's a uh, it's a tough game, and you at some some point this this all came and together also with your with your course which we can uh, talk about in a second but specifically with respect to the the code and and to the, the paper you made an apology video which was it's fairly lengthy it was not your usual style it was just kind of you standing there and you you essentially said straightforwardly you know here's what i did i credit i and didn't credit these people enough just took their code and and so on and um then people noticed that only like a few days later in your next videos it essentially you did the same thing like there there were slides where where you you took from somewhere and so on is it i don't know is it fair to say and so you made these videos, you made the apology videos, then you immediately started uploading videos before you really quit and you quit for a long time after that. What was, what were sort of the, the last videos like for you? Or, you know, like after, let's say, the apology video and so on, but before you quit, what was that like? You're asking about the time between when I quit to the apology video, what that was like? No, from the apology video, to the point where you it didn't upload for for months after that or uploaded very infrequently was how did you feel at the point like of the apology video and and a little after that yeah well i mean i felt pretty bad generally i'm a pretty happy guy as you can surmise mm. but um i could say that's the only time in my life where i've ever felt somewhat suicidal like uh just for a little bit and mm. uh yeah i didn't know how to deal with that level of sadness so i tried about a bunch of different things like i um moved from la i uh got a dog i just i don't know did some soul searching some meditation just tried out a bunch of i tried virtual reality like escapism as well um mm -hmm. it was a pretty tough time as you can imagine but in terms of like i yeah. Um, doing the same thing again. I guess I did, but I didn't think that I was like, maybe there's something mm -hmm. wrong with me. Like I just, I don't know. I don't know. Like I, I need it. I need some kind of mentor to be like, here is how you credit people in a YouTube video yeah. about machine learning. And here is what people are going to find acceptable. Yeah. Did you, did you think at some point, maybe I can turn this around, you know, maybe I can, because because you were at the beginning when when people brought these things up you were i i saw just a bunch of twitter posts and so on sort of discrediting them denying them like no i never never did anything like this w was there a point where you thought you know people are getting iffy maybe i can turn it around yeah yeah there was um i mean i tried everything i was like maybe i don't need to apologize. Maybe I do. That would make it better or worse. Maybe mm. I should just deny, deny, deny like politicians do. Maybe I should, you know, make fun of, you know, make like, uh, um, 
reply videos to other YouTubers who made videos about me. There's a lot of things that I thought I could do. Um, eventually I decided, and I don't even know if that was the best thing for my brand. I know it was the right thing to do to make an apology video morally, but I don't know if that actually helped me or hurt me. I still don't know to this day. Mm. Um, yeah. Was it, so I, I think if I hear this a little bit out of you that there was a time where you were still mainly thinking brand, mainly thinking, you know, which actions are going to let me still reach like the million subscribers or, or continue on. And then was there a particular point where you thought, no, actually, you know, let's, let's do an apology. Let's, let's tone it down. Um, was there, was there a time when you thought, when you consciously let go maybe of the million subscriber goal? There was, there was, I think it just came from introspection and seeing how like the, um, the amount of, um, I don't even know what you want to call it, uh, feedback, negative feedback or, um, criticism, it just wouldn't go away. It was just there and mm -hmm. it, it didn't really die down. And I thought, I mean, there's really nothing else I can do here. I need to just accept defeat, wave the white flag. Um, part of my brand is just like, you know, super confidence and always being, um, okay with being, um, like haters or whatever. So not even haters, yeah. but you know what I mean? And like, there was a point where I was like, ah, you know, I'll just apologize. And then I also felt, you know, near the end, I did feel, I started to feel like guilty because you know, some people said that it wasn't just that I plagiarized, but that I was actually doing the opposite of like accelerating, um, researching the space. Like this sets a bad example for people and this actually gets in the way of research and it's going to slow it down. And that's what I was like, okay, that's, if that's true, that's really bad. And honestly, I like, I was reading too many comments as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I still don't know to this day, like whether or not, um, the apology video helped or hurt my brand. In fact, if I had to bet, I would say it probably hurt my brand, but you know, at least I felt better afterwards and I guess that's what mattered in the end. Yeah. I mean, I think few people really understand what, what it's like to get YouTube comments on a, on, on a bit of a scale and, and, and people, there will, there will always be people criticizing and hating, especially, I guess you with very little credentials in the field. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess you have always had people saying, you know, this is a, maybe this is a clown, uh, has no credentials, whatnot. And, and it didn't help that you copied code because then y you not authoring the code also meant you knew less about the code, which might also be sometimes shine through a bit in your videos. But I think you, with time, you, you sort of learn to tune out the haters because you're going to get them anyway, but then sometimes they're right. Right. And, and I, I think it's, I think, you know, I don't think, and, uh, I don't think many people in the like public sphere get like have a good good understanding of when should I listen to the to the bad comments and when not because usually it's no right so right <laughs> yeah um so then then this this was this was very shortly people really complaining about plagiarized code and uh, this this paper which was one of the sort of big points raised. And then in a very short, like within a month or so, there was also the issue of a course you offered, mm -hmm. right? So you, you maybe, can you tell a bit how this course even came to be? You, you made videos at an insane rate. How did you, how did you think you could also offer a course and, and why? Yeah, I think it comes down to two things. One, I felt like I could do more than what I actually was capable of doing because I, my ego was so inflated at the time. So I, that's one. The other is just looking at the metrics. Generally, the videos 
that were about making money were the ones that did the best. Mm-hmm. And so I started to follow that trend and tailor my content in that direction, as opposed to what I would have done years ago, which is like, how do we solve the you know, millennium problems like poverty reduction and water cleanliness and um, environmental sustainability, things that you know actually matter. So mm-hmm. The course was around that, like, well, if people want to make money, let me make a course around making money with machine learning. That was what it's called, right? It was called Make Money with Machine Learning. Literally. That, that is a hell of a clickbait. Yeah. I, the most clickbaity, exactly what's going to get the views title. Mm-hmm. And it was supposed to be a paid course. It was, I think, about $200 per student. And the, the issue, the first issue was that you claimed it was like a limited entry course with personal supervision. Now, both of these things didn't really turn out to be accurate as, as you, you promised. So there was an issue of, you said, I only let in 500 people, but then you let in twice 500 people. So you, 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 you had two different Slack work, workspaces with twice the five. Some, I think one even had 700, but there, there's a few extra ones, I guess. And then also there was apparently not really like you can't you can't personally supervise a thousand two hundreds like it's impossible did you plan on these things already or did they just sort of how did they happen i didn't plan on them i did think that i would have 500 um but when Mm. i put the course out there were so many signed up so fast and i got greedy I was like, oh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to let this keep on going. Let's see how many people I can sign up for this. And then I thought, yeah, I can just have two different, uh, cohorts. And, um, you know, I had people volunteer to help at the time who helped me, like as I guess you call them teaching assistants and yeah. But they, they, how many, uh, roughly how many TAs did you have? Do you remember? Um, there was at least one. There might have been more yeah. than that. There was at least one. Yeah. yeah. But they they sort of, did they quit after a while or did they stick with you? Well, or? no, they actually, they were amazing. They stuck the whole yeah. time. Yeah. Okay. But they were they were volunteers. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it was 200 bucks and like one, two, three, maybe volunteer TAs for 1,200 students. And... You, did you plan on, on ramp? Did you realize at some point, I can't provide personal feedback to all of these students or, or did you just think, you know, whatever, I'll, I'll just, I can do this or. I did, I did realize I was in over my head. I, I think it was like week two or week three that it really started to dawn on me. Um, and then I think it, I think it was week four that some of the students started you know, going to social media. Um, and then everything came crashing down in the middle of the course. Um, and then I had to give out a bunch of refunds, but still had to finish the course to the end. It was a 10 week course. So we still had to keep going for five weeks after that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, there were still, you know, hundreds of students who stayed in the course. I don't know if you know that, like the register made an article on this, but they didn't say like, it's not like everybody just dropped out all of a sudden. Yeah. Still people in the course. I I still had some responsibility. Yeah. So I, I maybe briefly summarize these, these articles and you know, they're, they're written from a certain angle. Right. And, uh, that's, that's exactly why I also wanted to get your, just your side of, of this story. So, these articles, they claim, for example, that you know people started noticing there was no personal supervision. They complained. Um, you 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 never essentially showed up in the Slack workspaces. Well, you know, or or infrequently, mm-hmm. they all got the same feedback on their exercise. So that was the sort of like a copy paste of like good job. Um, mm-hmm. it, it it was it was like that. Then people started demanding refunds but were some claim they were even banned like for demanding refunds then it was also claimed that 
you eventually said there was a refund period, which was for 14 days, but the article claim you quietly introduced the refund period 30 days after the course started. So it was essentially impossible for anyone to have known because there was no refund policy at the beginning. You introduced a 14 day refund period 30 days after the, co the course started. You then, and then, you know, once, once people discovered that there were two different cohorts and so on, or how, what of these articles is is true and what is overdone um so there, there are also several several tweets of, of students that said yeah people claiming refunds were were banned um or or that the fact that you introduced this refund period how did this go down from your perspective so all that is true um what i don't i think was overblown is the banning part i never mm -hmm. personally banned anybody um, but I can't speak to whether or not one of the TAs may or may not have done that. I love yeah. But yeah, everything else, like definitely um, on point, like it's all a part of the, the story. Yeah, can't refute any of that. Yeah. And ha did you, did you get, did you get scared at any point or did you, were you still in this, you, because all of a sudden, people and their money are involved right it's not i mean 200 200 bucks is not that much for maybe an american but it is a lot for maybe someone in india or or something you know some place like this did you get at some point you know scared because like wow there's actual money here that i may have to pay back or yeah i mean i got scared for a lot of reasons i was scared that um, yeah, I would like have to go through some kind of lawsuits. People were saying like, oh, I'm gonna, there's going to be a lawsuit. You, you're lucky you're not in jail and stuff. And, um, yeah, about the refund stuff, like the 30 day versus sneaking it in. And I'm sure, I'm sure I did that. I honestly don't remember it now. Like, I'm, I'm sure like that's probably what happened. But I mean, when I look at it now, I'm like, I mean, it, when you charge money, you need to be very upfront with people and like. That's how you make a sustainable product. I wasn't thinking very sustainably in long term. It was a very short term thing. Um, but I was scared. Yeah, I was scared. Mm -hmm. Did you? But but your thought was still, I can educate these people, even if I can't give them personal supervision. Or or was it was it all like you know like I'm gonna get their two hundred bucks. I'm gonna tell them something so they can't complain or. Did you still think, you know, I can't, like the course has value for the people who are in it? No, I, I did think the course had value. I mean, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's weird because it's like I'm conflating my bias against academia and the traditional learning path with this course that is, yeah, it's got a super clickbait title. But, you know, I guess I didn't fully appreciate what online learning and I'm still learning what online learning really can be in the future. I thought, well, you know, you don't need to be in a, in a physical classroom to learn. Like, I think we can all agree to that now. Like you can watch videos online, but also, you know, what is, um, personal supervision and does there need to be X, Y, and Z for someone to be able to say, I learned a lot of learning comes from self-motivation and, um, you know, Education is not a scarce resource. It's, it's, it's abundant. It's the desire to learn that is scarce. And perhaps that alone, I felt justified. Like if I could get them to want to learn these things, that would be enough. Um, at the time I felt that way. Now I know like, mm -hmm. what would I change differently besides the obvious part, like the 30 day refund from the start is to just hire help. Like if I were to give advice to anybody doing anything like this, like any YouTuber, who wants to make a course like hire help step one hire help and then figure everything else out don't plan it out yourself it's too big it's it's too big at scale for one person to do what what happened did you end up giving refunds to to people or i did did you did you still have enough money to 
give the refunds? <laughs> um, I, yeah, I gave. Or what What happened to the money? Like, I I can imagine you get two hundred bucks, a thousand people. That's like two hundred k. Um, how where where did that go? Did you end up plus or minus, or did you spend on refunds? Did any lawsuit result or? There were no lawsuits. Everybody who wanted a refund got a refund. There were still a bunch of students who completed the course to the end. Like, and I'm very thankful. Like, despite all the drama, they were loyal to the to the thing. And so, was it? It wasn't negative. It was positive. It wasn't nearly mm -hmm. like probably like ten percent what I made at the start. Mm -hmm. And and then, you know, I I think. This, as I said, this was within like a month of of every everything down. You you were making lots of videos, the paper, the course, all at the same time, and then everything everything comes crashing. And and I think it's one it's one thing when you feel bad because life is is crap, right? Because something happened to you that's bad, and you know. But it's it's an entirely different thing when you're you you know you're responsible for it, right? It, like that is that is worse. That is like my life is bad, and I'm to blame. And and it you know like it's it's my my doing, right? Like was this? I guess this was your experience, right? It you know whether you thought it was good or bad, it was like my life is crap, and I'm responsible. How did you, what did you do at that point? You, you, you said a bit of soul searching and so on. How did you decide to, to go forward? Um, so I moved back to San Francisco. Um, I was there for a few months. I basically invested in my friends and family, talked to them. That helped. Um, got really into virtual reality. That helped as well, like disassociating from this reality into a virtual world um, where I was anonymous and uh, logged off of all social media as well. So that helped as well and kind of just gave up with the whole like, you know, million subscriber path that I was on. And what else? Yeah, just, um, oh yeah, focus on my health as well. Like I was like, I'm just going to like try to focus on being healthy because I can control that. I can't control what people mm -hmm. think, but I can control my health. So that helped. Right you you made a you made a quite astounding uh, body fitness transformation as well. You were at the end. You were like in 2019 when it all crashed. You were kind of a like a chubster, yeah. Like <laughs> right. Yeah. And I I saw like a before after picture. Was this a conscious effort by you or? It was. It was. Yeah. Because like. Part of like, what, you know, having a desire to live is to like be able to look in the mirror and, you know, say like, for me at least, like, hey, this is an attractive guy. So that, you know, it's kind of vain, but it definitely helped for sure. Like that. Yeah. And so you, you eventually you got, let's say, back up on your, on your feet after all of this. What was your, or what is your current plan or what are you doing right now you've you've posted a few videos again here and there but um i'm not so maybe you know what's what are you doing essentially so um yeah making videos along this series called alpha care about healthcare and ai which has kind of always been like my the industry i'm most excited about for ai like applicability like oh we can make people healthier so I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. I'm almost done with a book I've been writing for the past three months, um, which it's going to be a free ebook. I'm not going to charge for it. Um, so that's been interesting. That's also on like uh, deep learning for healthcare apps for beginners. A uh, bunch of examples mm -hmm. in there. And once I release that, all of this will be done in like three weeks probably from now. Um, like the series, the video series in the book. Then I have to figure out what the next thing I'm going to do is, um, what I'm most excited about currently is um, paying people to be healthy. Um, there's this app called Sweatcoin. It's out of the United Kingdom. It pays people in cryptocurrency to walk. I find that really, really interesting because, you know, two of the most meaningful things to me are 
um, keeping people healthy and reducing poverty. And this kind of does both at the same time. So I'm wondering if there's a way to create what's called a DAO, a distributed autonomous organization around mm-hmm. um, healthcare and health data and keeping people healthy, paying them somehow with cryptocurrency to stay healthy. I just use this service called Inside Tracker, which cost me like 500 bucks. Way too expensive a service for most people to use. Um, but I got a blood test done two weeks ago using the service. They took 43 biomarkers of mine. And that, now I have a bunch of health data, like my cholesterol level is apparently way too high because I eat way too much red meat. Um, so I've got to cut down on that. But something like this, if we could turn into um, like a free service that keeps people healthy and actually not just free, but pay them money and then somehow turn it into a business where also the service makes mm-hmm. money, that'd be really cool. So I'm kind of like thinking like I'm going to start some kind of company around that or a DAO, I should say. I'm not exactly yeah. sure what it looks like though. I mean, there. This is happening in part already. With I don't know. We have we have like high taxes on on cigarettes, right? So essentially, the the smokers they finance a little bit. The non-smokers via taxes. Some health insurances they already give discounts if you do like regularly go to it to a gym or something. So I'm like something like this is definitely in the in the realm of of possibilities. Now, with respect to cryptocurrency. Is this a meme or was there actually a Siraj coin at some point? Yeah. I haven't found anything. Like w- what What was that? Yeah, that was a real thing. I launched a cryptocurrency, I think two years ago or something, three, I don't know, uh, called Siraj coin. And uh, people really didn't like it. So I took down the video. I'm, I'm sure like yeah. there's still, you could find it if you really search Siraj coin. Okay. But it, it was just, it was more like for a video or did you think, you know, maybe I could make some money with launching my own cryptocurrency? Yeah, both. I mean, this was at the height of the um, ICO crate yeah. and everybody was doing it and I felt like, wow, mm-hmm. well, I'm, I'm going to do it too. Here we go. Siraj coin. Yeah. And the idea was that you can, with Siraj coin, you can uh, get a meeting, like buy a meeting with me or like make a music video with me, just, you know. I am the scarce resource. Like in these cryptos, there is a scarce resource. The great token, the token is how you access the scarce resource. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm glad I did it still. Like nobody got hurt from that. It was just like a fun experiment. And I learned a lot from it as well. Like I, I still think it's an interesting idea. Like I do think that we're going to see more individuals create tokens around themselves. And mm-hmm. um. I mean, yeah, a couple of NFTs work this way, right? That there is some kind of like a meeting with a famous person tagged onto it or, or something like this. Yeah, so with with respect to your your book and your new set of videos, and, you know, I guess that the question everyone asks is, uh, is there still, how how do you handle citations, plagiarism, things like this? Are you... Are you toning it down or are you like extra super duper careful or what is your sort of how do you approach this topic? I guess you're in a bit of a special situation, not not only are you held to the same standards, but now, you know, people read your name, they're probably the first thing they do is put something into a, a plagiarism checker. <laughs> yeah, I'm super careful. I put it in the video description, not just like the GitHub. I say it verbally. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I just try to be more careful. Um, Mm -hmm. yeah. And the, what's the book about? Can you, is there, is it something you can disclose already or? Yeah, it's on bioinformatics for beginners. Mm -hmm. I'm also a beginner to bioinformatics. I'm really interested in multi-omics, like all the omics, genomics, epigenomics, transcriptomics, um, and just thinking about how we can integrate all of these different types of data to make both diagnostic and prognostic uh, predictions for people. And I think that's the future. I'm really interested in reversing the aging process. Um, David Sinclair at Harvard has a great book on this called Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. He has a podcast that he's gonna release next year on this topic. And I just think that there's a great space for data science and data analyst enthusiasts to make a contribution in this field, because I do think the future of healthcare isn't going to be targeting individual diseases like 
Alzheimer's or heart disease, but rather that this the disease that is upstream of everything else, aging itself. Mm -hmm. That's a, I mean, it's a, it's a tough task. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, I guess it's a cool, cool outlook. I, it seems like a little bit of a, of a rebirth. It, you know, you told how you were at the beginning of your video career thinking if I could just, you know, make video about these cool topics and so on. And, uh, it, it, it almost feels, or at least to me, it sounds like it's got a little bit of that same spirit again. I'd like to think so. I mean, I, I, I don't have the same, I don't know. I don't have the same level of, or maybe I just feel this way. I don't have the same like energy that I did back then. Um, mm. where it's just like a, I have to do this or else like the world is going to end like that level of conviction. I just feel yeah. like, I mean, I'm really interested in biology in general. I don't think I'm going to mm. get, I honestly don't think this is going to get me the level of fame or opportunity that talking about deep learning from 2016 to 2020 did. It's just something I'm interested in. Uh, and I'm yep. okay, like not reaching a million. I mean, probably never going to reach a million subscribers. I just want to be interested in this. And it, even if, and you know, if this like company doesn't work out, I'm happy to like take a job somewhere and just like learn about bioinformatics full time as a bioinformatician analyst or something. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, in, yeah, in, I mean, in many ways, I, I've told you that this, this privately, but in, in many ways you were, you're sort of with, with all of this happening, you were still sort of a, the pioneer of what many of, of, of us other ML YouTubers, essentially that the path we go is you, you made it a kind of like. I remember when I started making videos, there was like nothing. And when you started, there must have been like really, really nothing, right? And um, you know that for, for, for all the things, I think it took, it took balls to, to go that way. And, and you, you certainly hustled, even if it led in, into like a wrong direction. Um, do you have, I don't know, do you have, do you have, because I know that there are, quite a number of people who look at maybe you also me other youtubers a lot of people are starting their podcasts nowadays uh, a lot of people also start channels like mine or or similar to mine any advice you have for people starting out in in the in the sphere of online education or what might what we might call being an influencer anything like this um yeah i would say that you, this is not something you do as a side job. Like a lot of people, you know, kind of have to, because they need a source of income from their day job. But, um, I would say like the only way to be successful in this is to pick it to be your one thing and do that all day. And it's got to feel like play to you, but it's got to look like work to other people. Like to me, this whole time I've just been playing, like really enjoying myself. Like it's not work. And that's honestly why I think I grew as much as I did. I genuinely enjoy the topics. I genuinely enjoy the video production process, editing, lighting, thinking about metrics, all of that stuff just felt like play to me. And that's how you're going to be successful. It's not going to be, if you feel like it's hard work, um, you should pivot or think of some other content to talk about, or maybe a different medium. Like, you know, I had a podcast as well. Um, I did, I think five interviews and then I stopped because it didn't feel like play to me. Like I don't actually, for some reason, I just don't enjoy being a podcast host. Like I enjoy monologues and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So I stopped. Um, whereas someone like you or, you know, Joe Rogan or other podcasters, they actually enjoy it. So they're going to, they're actually going to be successful. So that's, that's my best advice is like, make sure that it feels like play to you. And then I, you will be, you'll probably be successful. And when someone finds themselves a bit successful and finds themselves to be sucked and drawn by the metrics, by the clout, by because I already I already said it, but I'm, I'm gonna say it again. Like this is a this is a thing. I feel it. I like other YouTubers feel it for sure. This this suck. It's like a it's like a thing drawing you right and. You know, leading 
to the kinds of decisions y you made and and uh what is do you have any i don't know you know other than don't do it do you have any you know best the mindset that that creates in a person do you have any any maybe recognition of what could help someone to to get out of it or or to resist or you know what do you tell yourself when there's like a really easy opportunity to get a lot of views or 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 clicks i would say the best thing you can do is google sirajra ball and tap <laughs> into this guy and uh yeah just be afraid you don't want that to happen to you for sure um luckily it happened to me first so you've got an example in front of you now of what can go wrong when you follow views and likes too much you chase clout too much in the education space um the internet gives everybody a voice. You will be held accountable. Um, there is no, um, we are moving into a world that is much more transparent every day, less and less privacy. Um, yeah, the internet gives everybody a voice and power. So, um, yeah, that's, that's what I can say. Use it, use it wisely, I guess. Use it wisely. Well, Siraj Raval, this was this was a pleasure, really, truly. I I thank you very much for for being here with me today. Um, thanks for coming on. Thanks for being so open and 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 forward and 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 honest. I think it's very valuable. The world also hears from you, and you know, in a, not just from articles and 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 you know reviews and things like this. Absolutely. Thank you, Yannick. Awesome.